the first time, like the first music I was ever really into, I was like, you know, I was like watching the Partridge Family and stuff like that. I mean, it was would be in the seventies. I was uh, I was born in nineteen sixty four, so you know seventy four around there. I would be watching like the TV music of the day of the cartoons that I would watch, and they would put out records, and that would be like the first records I ever bought. Some of the pop stuff of the day, I remember like. The Lion Sleeps Tonight and 1910 Fruit Gum Company and songs like that, more pop driven stuff. And the first time I ever heard like distorted guitars and what I thought was rock music and what was rock music was I was in my parents' car and I would have been around 10, 11 years old and I heard uh, a song come on AM radio by a band called The Raspberries called Go All the Way. And it had, it opens with very distorted heavy guitar riff and then goes into this very sort of melodic ballady almost uh, verse and it immediately impacted me like that I remember it like it was yesterday because the collision of the very heavy distorted guitars and sort of like busy drums which I'd never really heard before and then a really poppy thing which I had known coming together was like blew my mind. So I immediately went out to my local record store and bought, had my parents buy me this record by this band called The Raspberries. And I immediately came, became consumed with them. And I had to get every Raspberries record, which is kind of ironic because the Raspberries were known as a singles band, but they had four albums and I bought them all. And I became this like crazy fan of the Raspberries, which nobody really was at the time, especially my age. And that was like it, that lit the, the spark. And then it was like a year later, or two years later, 76, I'm walking home from junior high school and I would walk right past a record store in my hometown of Madison. There's a store called Scotty's Records. And I walked by the store and I went in with my friend who I walked home from school with every day. And I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm gonna buy a record. I said, what, what record are you gonna get? He's like, well, I'm gonna get a record by this band called Kiss. And I had never heard of him. I didn't know anything about him. He said, come in. So he goes to the bins, he goes to the records, and he goes, uh, I said, what are you going to buy? Which one? And at the time, the new album was Rock and Roll Over. This was 76. He said, well, I'm going to buy this one because this is the new one. He said, if you're going to try getting into them, buy the one before it. Because I don't know how this one is because it just came out. The one before it was really good. The one before it was Destroyer. So I had some money, and I was like, okay, I guess I'll try something new. And I bought Destroyer. And I walked home that day and I put the record on, looked at the cover, heard the beginning of the record, Detroit Rock City, and it was like game over. Like my Raspberries records at that time being a little kid, like they couldn't even be in the same room with my Kiss records. It was like a whole new world opened up. And I just became consumed with all things Kiss for a couple of years. It, was be, it would be a couple of years before I would even consider letting another band into my world. And the next band I let in was Aerosmith, but, but I mean, it was Kiss Mania for me, and that's what really set me on my whole path to get into music. First concert was Kiss, 77, December 16th, Madison Square Garden. Went with uh, my best friend, his sister took us, and the opening band was Piper, which was Billy Squire's first band. Still love Billy and still love Piper to this day. I remember being completely, like I was in the top level of Madison Square Garden and I just remember like the whole scene walking in, the smell of like the carts selling the pretzels, the people outside selling the t-shirts, getting inside smelling this weird smell in the air, I didn't know what it was, everybody high, I didn't know what that was. And then the other thing that really really remember about that show that, that people have a hard time understanding, but you got to remember I was 77, I would have been 12, 13 just turned 13, I didn't understand the concept of amplification. So here I was at the top of the, the garden with 15, 20,000 people, and then the band is looking this big to me, but it was loud as hell. And I couldn't understand how a band of guys playing a guitar that far away, that small, could be that loud where I was sitting. And it took me a while to realize that the power of amplification as, at a very young age, but it was totally moving and impactful. And the second concert I ever went to two years later, Kiss at the, at the Garden again, Dynasty Tour. And then, you know, from there it just went. Well, I wanted, 
I took drum lessons for a brief time and I just it was really frustrating to me because I wanted to have a kit like Peter Chris had and I wanted to be able to play to those records and every record I had immediately and taking drum lessons I was given sheet music and a little drum pad and tin, 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 tin. and I was like no I gotta be you know and I just didn't have the patience and the discipline I was like really needed to go so I flamed out really quick I really didn't put a lot of effort into it but I flamed out really quick on the idea of actually trying to be a musician so then my thought process shifted to how can I still work in the music industry and connect with all these bands and help all these bands I love? See, that was a really big thing for me because most of the bands that I love, most other people I knew did not like. And they made fun of me for liking. And I was very marginalized. In high school, I was very outcast for what I liked. I was not in the cool crowd at all. And it really bothered me, and I was just like, man, these artists need more respect, and they need to be treated respectfully, and more people should know about them. So that became my thinking, like, how can I be around the music? How can I help these artists? How can I... It was never about how can I become well-known, or how can I uh, be, become famous. It was about how can I help the bands that I love. So the first thing I did when I was in high school was I wrote the music column in my high school newspaper. Then in my senior year, my hometown has three colleges in it. Drew University came to the high school and said, hey, would you like to, any of your students like to learn radio, we want to keep the, the campus radio station on while the college kids go away for the summer. So I immediately raised my hand, went there, and that's where I first sort of cut my teeth on what radio was. And then I started working in a record store right out of high school, which for me was like the holy grail of jobs. Greatest thing in the world. So here I was already at like 17. I was selling music. I was meeting people from record companies who would come into the record store. I was... I had already got some interest in radio. I was writing about music because because of having written the high school column I started contributing to a local New Jersey paper called The Aquarian, an East Coast rocker, and started doing some freelance writing. So I was writing, I, was, I had all these things that I was doing all about bands that I loved. And that's really what it was all about. It was this sort of focus of like anything I can do to connect with these artists and to get more people to acknowledge them. And then from there it snowballed. It was just like I was relentless. It was like, okay, now I'm going to work at a... Uh, I'm going to try to work for a record company where I can sign bands. Okay, now I'm going to actually try to do a radio show on a real radio station. So the local station that I grew up with in New Jersey, DHA, I started pounding them with tapes and started telling them, hey, you know, you got to play this hard rock music. Nobody's playing it. They would come into the record store, the guys that owned it. Oh, shut up, kid, shut up. So I made a demo tape. And I didn't know what I was doing in radio, but I had a friend that was really into radio. He had a pirate radio station in his basement. And we went in there one night and I recorded a demo. And then they finally let me get on the air playing the music I wanted one time a week. And that was one of the first ever radio shows in history to focus on metal in America, for sure. One of. And, and that was, would have been 83. So it was just running and building and doing everything that I could to build the artists that I loved. Because so many people know me from what I've done in radio and TV, but... How I ended up working in the record business for a little while was that, this is a kind of interesting story, but 1983, I started my metal show. And Johnny Z had a record flea market in New Jersey. Johnny Z is the guy that started Megaforce Records, founded Metallica and Anthrax and all that stuff. So I would go to his flea market just as a fan, and I would buy Kerrang! magazine and all these albums that I loved that only he was getting. I got to know him from just going to his, his store. And when I got the radio show on in 83, I would go buy records down there, and then I would play them on my show. And Johnny quickly realized something, that records I was playing, because I was the only one playing them on the radio, he'd sell more in his store. So one day I went in to get records, and Johnny just gave them to me. 
He's like, don't worry about it. Just take these. Take this. Try this. Try this. And I was like, what's going on here? And I realized he was like, just play it. Play it. Because he would get, you know, he'd sell a lot more because people heard it on my show and would go there and buy to drive it. To drive there to, to buy it. So um, we developed a friendship. And then Johnny came to me very six months into me being on the radio doing this metal show in 83 and he knocked on the door he literally knocked on the door of the radio station because it was a, you know, not in any corporate building it was in like a house on, on the highway I was like what's the guy from the flea market doing here like what the hell's going on and I, I pulled the curtain back I go John I'm, I'm in the middle of doing a radio show I was new to radio I was nervous being on the air still I was like I can't you know I, I can't be dealing with you what, why are you here and he goes you just gotta let me in he walks in the studio, because Johnny's very persistent for people that don't know him. And he walks in the studio and he goes, you got to do me a favor. I was like, what's up? He goes, you got to play this band. I just put out their record. Nobody understands it. If anyone's going to give it a shot, it's going to be you. I go, what? what are you talking about? Just leave it. I'll listen to it. you got, you got to go. And he's like, no, not leave until you play a song. I was like, what is it? Pulls the record out. It was Metallica, Kill Em All. And he gives me the record. He goes, just play a song. i got to hear it on the radio, and then I'll leave. So I did. I played the record that night. I played one song while he was standing there. And I didn't know what I heard. I'd never heard anything like Metallica before. I was like, what the hell is this? And he goes, thank you. And he wrote, I still have it. I still have the record. He wrote on the cover, Ed, you were the first. Thanks, Johnny Z. And he left the record. And he, he walks out, and I didn't know what just happened. I was like, okay, whatever. And as he walked out, he said to me, I got this label that's putting out this Metallica record called Megaforce. He's like, if I can ever afford to hire someone and get this company really going, I'm going to hire you. Yeah, 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 sure, get out of here. And sure enough, he, a couple of years later, he calls me up. And he said, I got good news and bad news. I said, what's that? He goes, well... The good news is, as you know, Metallica's taking off, and I have money to hire you, and I want to offer you a job. I'm like, wow, well, you have your word, thank you. Goes, What's the bad news? He goes, the bad news is you're not going to be working with Metallica because the reason I have money to hire you is because they're leaving me to go to Elektra and another manager, and in the settlement I have the money to build the label, though. So, okay, let's go. So I went to, uh, he gave me the, the office address, and my first day at work, I'm thinking I'm pulling into some office, and it's an old address in Old Bridge, New Jersey. And I'm in a residential area, and I'm like, oh, I guess we're going to have some coffee or something before we go to the office. Little did I know, the office was, at that time, a phone extension next to his kid's crib on the floor in his living room of his house. And that's how I started with Megaforce Records. I spent three, four years there, and titles were handed out much more liberally than money. So it was like, we'll elevate your title to make it, you know, give you more status, but we don't have any more money to pay you. But it was a great experience. It was a lot of fun. And one of the things I really wanted to do was the label was known for such heavy music. Anthrax, Overkill, Metallica, Manowar, Raven. And I said to him, you know, John, I would love to, I love all this stuff, but I would love to be able to bring in some stuff that maybe could get played on the radio and take us to another level. And he's like, well, what do you got in mind? And again, go back. I was a huge Kiss fan. And, I, and Ace Frehley was out there. Nobody had even known what he looked like without his makeup, really, at that point. I said, we should track down Ace. Johnny was not and is not a Kiss fan. But he kind of knew that I was, and he knew that he'd take a chance on what I was saying. And he goes, okay, let's try to find him. We found him through Eddie Kramer. We had lunch, and the first guy he ever ended up signing to a record deal turned out to be a guy that... Uh, you know, nine years earlier was my first playing in a band that was my first ever concert. And there is a photo of in my first book of me in a lawyer's office at however old I was with Johnny and Marsha and Ace literally signing him to his first solo record deal. So it's a it's a crazy sort of full circle story.